Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Wall Street Wildlife. Today we're talking about what, Christoph? We are talking about fear. And that's because investing can be one of the most direct paths to life-changing wealth. But there are several obstacles, the biggest of which is fear. So we have a special Owl's Nest episode in which we define fear and ways to begin to use it to our advantage. Yes, yeah, a terrible, like, what's that saying? Feel the fear and do it anyway. And like, <laughs> to my mind, investing is the most reliable. It can be the simplest path to long-term wealth, financial independence, all the good stuff. And if your fear gets in the way, uh, that can be devastating. So we're going to explore that topic in today's special episode. And if you haven't started investing Hopefully, this will be one of the little things that nudges you across the line. And if you're already investing, but maybe you're not investing as as significant an amount as you could, perhaps in understanding your fears of investing a bit better might help you increase and make this a bigger part of your life. Yeah, I would only add, Badger, that this is, I think, not a little thing. I think this is maybe one of the single biggest topics we could talk about and it deserves our our full attention it deserves i think everyone's attention because all kinds of successes and mistakes all stem from from how we manage and understand fear before we get into investing anything you're scared of got any phobias got any fears in your real life yes i have a fear that i'm going to not see the eclipse today in austin (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because of the very heavy cloud cover and threatening thunderstorms at the moment. But the plan is, and by the way, this is nuts. Having just uh, visited Austin not too long ago, uh, it turns out we've gained approximately an additional 1 million people that have flocked well, purely to view the eclipse, which now might not be too visible, but we shall see. Sorry to hear that. You know, uh, fear of a solar eclipse is something called cosmicophobia. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, and well, eclipses can, uh, can scare animals, right? And we're all just animals inside. Yeah, I'm so curious to see, right, how our animals w- will react to this. The other thing is, uh, three days ago, four days ago, I was taking bunk on a walk, going down my driveway, and I came... Uh, this close to stepping on a very, very big snake that w- that crawled from out of under my my shiny red Model Three. Uh, <laughs> before I know it, like Bunk was actually on top of this giant snake, and I started like the fear. Uh, Cersei had quite the laugh after I got very, very far quickly from that snake. <clears throat> like I've, I've handled snakes in the past. I used to live with one, but uh, that feels like a somewhat rational fear, fear of snakes. I think it is fairly rational. And then on next door yesterday, I saw somebody posting uh, several photos of rat, rattlesnakes. Like, so, you know, <laughs> those guys don't play around. So, yeah, fear's, uh, fear's a thing. <clears throat> fear is the mind killer. I've just watched June 2 again yesterday. Oh, is that about fear? Uh, there's a... There's a, a litany against fear that the uh, the main character recites to sort of control his emotions. It's a uh, almost applicable to investing. I, I could I could dig it out. It's quite interesting. Okay, yeah, please. Uh, hang on a <clears throat> it's a Bene Gesserit saying, which uh, from from Dune the book, and the, the, it goes, "I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that." brings obliteration i will face my fear and i will permit it to pass over me and through me and when it has gone past i will turn the inner eye to see its path where the fear has gone there will be nothing only i will remain sounds fancy sounds true <laughs> yeah i think there's some lessons in there great great book right so uh, anyway let's not talk about science yeah. fiction let's focus on fear of investing which is right. the uh, headline for today's episode Easier said than done. So I have a a quote myself that I wanted to share with our listeners. It's by the uh, poet David White, who wrote, It is always hard to believe that the courageous step is so close to us, that it is closer than we could imagine. 
that in fact we already know what it is and that that step is simpler more radical than we had thought which is why we so often prefer the story to be more complicated our identities equally clouded by fear and the answer safely in the realm of impossibility so i think what he's saying is that the the courageous truth is uh is actually in the sense simple and in this case you know just start investing but because of its simplicity that kind of like directness brings up this protective side of us which starts creating stories to complicate the matter because when the when the solution is simple and direct well what's what's the option you just start doing it right but our minds out of this protective mechanism clouded by fear as he says complicate things and make them seem impossible so i think the open question for us to talk about is how many investors do we know or how many people rather do we know that have not started their investing journey because one way or another they're bound to or bound by or limited by what we would more, most simply call a fear of what that journey means it's probably the large majority of people are not investors i feel like this is a somewhat niche community and there's probably lots of reasons why people don't invest and maybe we'll talk about some of the others on future podcast episodes you know for one just kind of don't know enough about it feel like don't have the knowledge or maybe just don't have feel they don't have the time or maybe you don't feel you don't have enough money to make it worthwhile but probably fear is a big one in that litany of reasons why you might not stop yeah and what's the fear let's get a little more specific what is it a fear of i think most literally it's a fear of losing your hard earned money right if 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 you knew you would invest and you would succeed no matter what people would everybody would be an investor right? Because you'd be stupid not to, in the sense that if it was guaranteed, you would do it. Well, there's, a, there's a sort of knowledge element as well, because what some people might think of as investing is like get rich quick, and that isn't investing. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, that is a very dangerous world to occupy if you think this is a quick fix. It's not a quick fix, but fear is that is that animal emotion we feel that I think signals there is risk involved so it's not a sure thing regardless of how well you might prepare and what you might do because risk is it's a it's a question of probability and risk and risk management which which is i think what fear is the emotion we feel that it's like alarm bells saying risk is on the table yeah and i suppose you know the whole social media and news cycle these days is driven by extreme emotions and the you know the biggest engagement emotion is probably fear it's up there that's what you know fear sells um and so you if you read about investing just in the popular press you're probably either reading about people making absolute fortunes on nvidia if it's the last year or you're reading about people losing their pants because they were in things like ftx and crypto scams and other kind of bad actors and bad stuff happening. Yeah. So, I think I want to start by saying and checking in with you how how you think about this. I don't think you could live a full life trying to keep fear away. Like pushing fear away to my mind is um just sets you up for a more shallow existence and and a less rich experience of of living just first and foremost and obviously that also applies to investing yeah I fully agree with that like having just come back from a ski season and now deep in the depths of planning like a motorbike tour down to southern europe uh i feel like i've got a fairly high risk tolerance and i feel like some of those physical activities make me feel alive like life wouldn't be worthwhile for me without them but recognize that everybody is different and everybody has their own risk tolerance and that could still be like the different right answer for everybody could still be the right answer right so i want to ask you about how you uh, as a motorcycle instructor how you coach people through fear 
because there's lots of reasons for you to be good at know how to do that, right? From the therapeutic angle, which is uh, something that I'm trained in, I've been taught that if you want somebody to deepen into their life and to find a way to move through the barriers, the obstacles that are hindering their current uh, capacities and abilities, the answer is always to move toward the emotion rather than trying to find ways to dance around it, which is kind of counterintuitive. The thought of like bring fear closer to you, experience it more deeply. On the surface, that sounds like, why the hell would I do that? Fear is by definition scary (laughs) and unpleasant and challenging. I want less of it. I want to keep it out. But for you to gain a better facility with surfing the waves of it, you have to get in the water, right? So you have to continually, I'm not sure if uh, expose, I would use the word expose. I don't think I'm um, selling the notion of exposure therapy per se, but in a good, safe setting where you're uh, with trusted advisors, experts, there's a way of studying it. That's maybe the the way I, I would think of it. You bring it close, you think of an experience that, say, makes your palms sweaty, and you study what happens when, for example, you think of what it would feel like to lose $1,000. That might be a big number for you. That might be a small number. You, you adjust it, right? But then, so if you're, so put it this way, if you're a beginning investor thinking about starting this journey, instead of just being rash and you know, gung ho and, you know, I'm just going to do it. I would recommend what I'm recommending is this first step, study the experience in your body of what it would feel like to have fear arise and actually just be with it. And this requires uh, what I would call awareness and mindfulness. If you want to use that term, allow the feeling to be there for some time and by some time, that's, you know, th- that depends, but it's not just like, a, <laughs> oh, yeah, I thought of it. Oh, yeah, that would feel bad. No, you want to really allow the feeling to move through your body in that prompt. Notice what happens when you imagine losing a losing thousand dollars, the fear, the, the adrenaline, whatever happens ought to come up and then you stay with it. And then afterwards, you, re- you probably will come to some kind of conclusion. Oh, that was really unpleasant. Oh, I don't like that feeling. Or maybe, oh, yeah, that's unpleasant, but it's not the end of the world. Oh, this is less scary than I thought. And it's something I could probably learn how to navigate. How do you approach uh, coaching people through fear in, in, for example, motorcycle, the motorcycle world? Not about fear specifically, but um, but that that parallels into uh, developing your skills on a bike. Like I'm, I'm not a motorcycle instructor. I used to decades ago be a voluntary advanced motorcycling observer slash coach. So you, know, you take people who, from the point where they're legally able to ride a bike, to try and get their skill level up, so they hopefully don't murder themselves on the road or other road users. Uh, and so I think the parallel into what you're saying is find a safe place to practice and then just sort of build your skills slowly. Um, there are certain uh, sort of immutable guidelines, like one is on a motorbike, one is always be able to stop within the distance you can see to be clear. But you could probably, you know, tackle this upcoming sequence of bends a little bit quicker than you did last time if you got a better road position uh, but bearing in mind that, you know, thou shalt not be going so fast that you can't stop when you see like a, a sheep around the corner or whatever it might be, a brick wall that you didn't expect. So um, build up slowly. So in investing terms, start with a smaller portfolio. If $1,000 is actually a scary amount of money, you could start paper trading with $0. You, know, you could start building your skills using trading simulators. Although I would say... Uh, Make sure they're good ones that really do reflect like bid off a spread and all the other sort of confusing stuff that we talk about in other episodes. So you get like an accurate result. Um, or, or start off with a couple of hundred bucks in trading account. Maybe start off with simpler products like 
passive index investing for a couple of years just to build your confidence that long-term compounding can get on your side and can deliver life-changing returns. You know, start to see the first few years of that, perhaps before you get into investing in individual companies, which is a sort of different skill set than we do talk about in this podcast. Although, you know, I want to push back a little bit on paper trading. Everything you said, I think, is legit. But as I was listening to you, I got the same feeling I get playing in home poker games where the stakes are very, very low. And what ends up happening is that it's no longer poker because people are unafraid. Right. right? So they so they play every hand because they, they don't experience fear. And I would say that's never poker, right? That's just card shuffling. Uh, so the pushback against paper trading, I would say, would be, okay, to, to see how your decisions play out without any consequences, it's a useful tool. But you'll f- be fooling yourself if you think that translates exactly to what real investing feels like, because real investing does carry legitimate risk of loss. And so they're not the same. And I would probably advise what you said, what you said, I think, at, um, in the secondary way is start with an amount that does, that does not feel a lot, but it's still real. So paper trade to learn the basics, but then call it a hundred bucks account. That still gets you the same kind of reps, right? You still get your reps in, but now the you, I don't want to lose a hundred bucks. You you make decisions more realistically. I agree with what you're saying. I think it's possibly for a different reason though that analogy works because in poker you're playing against another human being, and so if you're playing in an environment where the stakes matter, they're not just completely irrelevant, then you should be playing fiercely enough that you instill fear in your opponent and thus benefit from the doubt and the fear they're facing because you're playing in a a particular style and you're playing winning poker if you're playing aggressive, attacking poker. But so so I think to that extent, that's true. Your, Your comments about paper trading maybe being a bit a bit of a flawed approach. I think it can still work though if you you, you try and treat these trades as real. The, the, um, you don't you know you don't just arbitrarily go all in on kind of meme stocks and nonsense and zero data expiry options and then win and go, oh, I'm a genius. See, but I think therein lies the rub, and I think this is why this is such an important topic. As animals Fear when it comes up is is over. It can be overwhelming and it's instinctive. Often it's irrational. You can't mimic it. You can't like simulate it. And so the the I think rational idea behind paper trading is you convince yourself that you are trading and you're managing it and you're trying to be like a real trader. But really, you're not. There's not enough of the authentic genuine risk on the table that's it it, it protects you from what i would say the real fear right it's the difference that we know as poker players right between playing at a low stakes uh game that you know with only some amount of max on the table worst comes to worst i'll only lose a little bit versus say you know going up the higher levels and having a legitimate amount you care about you know that you feel the difference and, and there's another big downside in paper trading that we didn't touch on, but it occurs to me as we're talking. Um, it takes years, literally, let's say minimum five years, to know whether you're a good investor or not, probably more like 10 years. Um, and so if you were literally to spend five years of your life, you know, your human lifespan, practicing, well, that's five years you weren't actually generating real returns. So... Yeah, I'm going to take back the comments on paper trading because it's because if nothing else, you're wasting your time. And if you if you think you've learned something in one year, you haven't really learned whether you're a successful investor. That was really just you know the luck of what markets were doing at that time. Maybe the only thing you might learn from being a paper trader is just some of the technical stuff, like what does it mean to click the buy button and sell and and you know to, to force you to to, to sort of encourage you to 
look at stock prices and start to understand how fundamentals might drive real valuations. Right. I don't think paper trading is is useless. I think there, there's a lots of there's lots of ways you could use it to track investment ideas. And you imagine if I invested five percent of my portfolio in this one company, how would it have done? And like you said, learning the the mechanicals of investing it's a good tool. But we're talking about fear, and I think the upshot here is you cannot simulate fear. You do not know what it feels like until it's actually you're in the middle of it. And boy, is it surprising! I'll I'll, I'll say this about you know t- the poker analogy. I've been out of practice for several years now. Um, just really haven't you know put my time in. But back in the day, uh, it, like you were saying, it's a it's a process you develop over time, and it takes months and months before sitting at a real game the palms stop, you know, you just gain more of that confidence and you you can play aggressively and you're not easily intimidated. But until then, boy, like each and every time, like it comes up over and over again. Um, scuba diving is another, I, I don't know if this is too many analogies, but when I was getting my advanced certification in the Great Barrier Reef, one of the skill sets was to do a night dive, go to the ocean floor, hide your torch. So it's pitch black, (laughs) you know, and then you had to navigate via the compass uh, when you can't see anything and all you could hear is the, your, your heartbeat. But before actually going to the uh, descending to the floor, I forgot to take my, what's it called? (laughs) I forgot to replace my uh, snorkel with the with the regulator, <laughs> as I start, so as I start <laughs> descending, all of a sudden, you know, I breathe in uh, a yeah. bunch of water, and then I'm splashing around, I'm panicking, right? And the instructor basically, you know, he yells at me like, "You bloody fool!" He was an Aussie guy. "You bloody fool! What's the matter with you?" Like, <laughs> but you know, why did that mistake happen? Probably because I'm about to do a scary thing. I'm not used to it. So the basic thing of replacing a snorkel with a regulator just went out my mind because I'm overly frantic. How do you get better at that? You don't unless you're in the water practicing doing that over and over and over again. Sorry for the long-winded <laughs> story, but like... No, that's right. Yeah. It t- ties into what we've said so far. Like get started and practice and reflect and learn from the things you've experienced because it's it's a lifetime process investing. You know, You learn through mistakes yeah and the next step i think on this journey that i would encourage anyone any beginner listening to this is take seriously the question where is the fear in your body when you in other words this has to do with uh moving toward it and not fighting it you don't want to fight fear that just creates anxiety you don't want to ignore fear that's the being delusional and it it leads to bad outcomes like uh uh thinking you're way smarter than you are the i think deep learned wise way is to acknowledge it's part of the game and you study it and by study i'm saying literally to you when you begin experiencing fear around investing pause and begin to legitimately give yourself space to notice when you feel fear, what is it that happens? Is it in your palms? Is it in your eyebrows? Is your Does your heart go start going quicker? There's all kinds of ways we experience fear. You identify it and then you actually be with that whatever bodily sensation. And over time, you become, I don't know how to say this, uh, wiser to it. You're no longer surprised by your initial reactions and you... Um, you familiarize yourself with it. That's how wisdom is born, right? That's how you stop being scared of it. And this it's, it's is a funny reason that might stop someone from starting investing because actually the majority of people probably don't fear feel fear about investing. They just don't care enough. Mm. And that I think that comes from a lack of awareness about the extent to which being an investor can change your life. I don't... I had sort of the opposite experience maybe a month ago um, during ski season. I got a call from an old buddy who's a recruitment agent 
And he said, Luke, I've got just the perfect job for you. If you want to come back, you know, six to nine month contract, you can still ski. And I, I gave it 24 hours to dwell on that idea of unretiring. Essentially, I'm semi-retired because of being an investor for 20 years. And I gave it 24 hours to think about that. And I almost felt a fear of losing the flexibility yeah. and just this incredible lifestyle that I'm enjoying right now. And it could end tomorrow, who knows, right? But um, I'm very grateful for where the trajectory of my life so far um, and, and the fear of giving up some of that flexibility and freedom that came from investing. But it, it feels almost like the opposite side of it. If you've not started investing, you don't realize what you're missing out on. I mean, to me, it is literally the, it's how you win at life, getting out of the rat race, get your money working for you. And if you haven't started that, you should be scared today of the fact that you haven't started. Right, right. That's a good, right. Which is what our podcast is about. It's, it's offering our 40 years or whatever, combined 40 years of experience to say, like, we've gone through every last hoop and mistake and success and we've pretty much you know committed all the errors and um this is what they feel like and don't let them stop you because it, it, it's a legitimate way to living a really fulfilling life the one the one uh last piece perhaps i'd like to add is a misunderstanding of uh the virtue of equanimity which i think is in a lot of ways the antidote to fear. Can, can you define the term for us? I'm, I would struggle to define equanimity. Sure. Uh, equanimity is the capacity to be at ease or relaxed in the midst of difficulty. And so you could see this in all kinds of people. Uh, the people who, when things go bad, panic immediately and are overrun by their emotions so that their emotions control them. Or people who, despite the situation being difficult, scary, challenging, can stay within their emotions. They experience their emotions, but they are not governed by them. So think exactly, I think, the expert poker players. Of course they feel fear, but they've trained themselves to not just feel it, but to remain rational and to not be governed by the fear, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that the one, uh, if this is the our owl's nest segment, you know, hopefully we're, we're throwing some wisdom at you. The, the wise point around equanimity that I'd like to underscore is that's not the absence of fear. You as an investor, I don't think will ever stop feeling fear, whether it's explicit or a lot or subconscious and a little, what equanimity shows us if you acquire it is it's staying steady in fear's presence which requires again i think a more deliberate awareness that this is the first step you have to welcome in on your investing journey all right good so i feel like we tackled some of the emotional aspects of this topic quite well um should we try and make it practical as well so maybe putting the emotional side away, let's think about what does it mean to be afraid of investing? What are the specific things you might be scared of? So let's reel a couple off and then maybe we can dispel some illusions around them. Like one is clearly just, you know, fear of volatility, like stuff is going to happen. My stock prices are going to go down. I'm going to lose money. Yeah. Uh, lack of control. When we're, I mean, most of the times when we're scared of anything, but especially in the investing world, it's because we realize we are not control in control of the outcome. So you could uh, do all kinds of work. You could be smart. Uh, you, you could think X, Y, and Z, but then some other outcome shows up because life, black swans and so forth. And that aversion to not being in control is one way people, I think, try to move around engaging directly with fear. If I can't control it, I don't want any part of it. And investing is uncontrollable in, in certain ways. And so let's, let's sort of get inside how you 
mechanically how you deal with that. And it's, I think it's probably simple because I have no idea what's going to come from my stocks the rest of today, tomorrow, next month, next year, maybe next three or four years. Like weird stuff can happen and unexpected things can happen. I can lose money. But I think if I zoom out, truly zoom out to a five-year, 10-year, 20-year lifetime view, if you're holding good quality investments and you know that's a whole different thousand things you have to really know about to, to build as you build continue the journey the lifetime journey of building that skill set to know how to identify a good investment but if you're truly holding good investments they will deliver life-changing wealth in the long term they could go down like amazon went down 80 percent at one point in its history um and if you got scared out of what was one of the world's greatest companies, yep, yeah, you'd have lost money. But if you understood the stock and stuck with the story, then you'll have realized a, a multi, multi bagger. You'll have multiplied your money many, many times over by sticking with that good quality company. So that volatility, by, ne- by definition almost, is a short to medium term thing. Stocks go up in the long run. I think this is this is related, maybe a little tangentially. I'm thinking in poker terms again and going back to equanimity. You could have a really, really good strong hand, and then lo and behold, your lucky opponent catches a lucky card on the river, and you've just lost a big pot, right, that you were statistically favored. The way I differentiate good players and bad players is the bad player who suffered that bad beat will emotionally uh, the wheels come off. It's called going on tilt. And then they, they are then governed by their emotions, right? Because they say to themselves that shouldn't have happened. I was the better, right? They, they, they justify and then they get angry and overwhelmed and then they play poorly, which is when all the sharks descend and know that's the guy to target versus a pro in this sense that we're talking about it, who's been through this, these situations over and over and over again, when a bad beat happens, what do they do? They turn to the guy that got lucky and they say, good hand. And then they move on right to the next hand. That's exactly what I did when you, when you, <laughs> when you took all my money, I said, hmm. <laughs> let me add them. Let me, no, no, no. Good, 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 good hand badger. Although that was not a bad beat situation, so maybe it's important. Maybe it's important. I hit the whole way. <laughs> if you if you're not referring yeah, to, had, go check yes, out our, the, uh, hiker, yeah, yeah. the little true. extract of our mini poker tournament uh, out <laughs> on the last episode, episode twenty one. There's five minutes. If you're on the YouTube as well, you can see Christoph crumpling as he realizes he's been betting into the better hand. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think our encouragement here is. To acknowledge fear, to if you're on the if, if you're on the precipice of wanting to become an investor or increasing the stake, the size of your investing, ask yourself whether or not it is fear that is holding you back, and hopefully some of these methods that we talked about analogies uh, were useful to you, and you could you could actually begin experimenting with some of these tactics. I would call them tactics. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, let me throw in another mechanics one as well because I think it's it's useful and actionable. Like you could be scared of the unknown, and one way to conquer that is just to build your knowledge. So, you know, that is listening to podcasts like this one and many other excellent finance podcasts out there. It's finding a buddy who's interested in this topic and just starting to talk about it. It's joining an investment service like Seven Investing, where you've got a community of thousands of other like-minded investors trying to find the world's greatest companies and getting into the community on Discord and chatting about them and hearing the counter case uh, and really sort of exploring the thesis. Immersing yourself in this world, if if you want to go beyond being an investor in just sort of passive index trackers, which everybody should do, you want to go beyond that to the next level of analyzing individual companies there are incredible resources out there get yourself onto twitter onto x and then go check out 
Christoph and my list of the people we follow. I've got 250 follow, follows on my account, uh, and at least 200 of those are fantastic resources for due diligence. Just go copy my follow list. You can find me at 7 Luke Hallard. And I'm at 7 Flying Platypus. And maybe most importantly, check out wallstreetwildlife.com where your your humble guides, Badger and Monkey, compiled the 10 laws of the investing jungle into a shiny, fancy PDF for you to download. And uh, we don't talk about fear explicitly, but in those 10 laws, you will find many important principles to help guide you on your investment path. So we're trying to do our best to knock down your resistance to building life altering wealth via investing and learning how to think about experience and work through fear is as per today's conversation i think one of the most important steps so we encourage you also to reach out to us you could find us uh on those social platforms leave a comment on our YouTube channel after you've smashed the like button and the subscribe button, which is down below, right? That's what they say. It's somewhere down below. And we are here to, uh, to support you. Yeah, this is a free resource and we intended this podcast. We're going to focus future episodes much more closely, I think, on trying to demystify investing and be more beginner friendly. We're still going to tackle some of the complex stuff and the really interesting stuff that's happening with some of these fantastic companies. But we'd like to try and bring a simple lens to many of these topics and try and make this accessible to everybody because investing changed my life and I think it can change yours too. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.